All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's POW seminar. Uh, online folks, please let me know if you hear and see everything properly. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce today's seminar speaker. It's a local uh, colleague today, Florian Tornoff. He came from NASA GIS, Manhattan, uh, to give the seminar today. Um, I have known Florian uh, for maybe two, three years, roughly, due to our interest in mixed phase clouds, LES modeling. Um, but Florian is also um, busy with field campaigns and using observational data to tune models or to, to understand our our uh, uh, the science of aerosol cloud interactions or improve our understanding on that. And on that topic, we, we came together an ice nucleation person with an LES uh, cloud modeling person. A few words to uh, Florian's education or, or you know uh, career. He did his uh, master's and PhD at the Freie University in Berlin. And I tried to see if there's an English translation. And if you translate it, it's the Free University of Berlin, but that doesn't really make sense. So let's keep it German. Uh, there is no translation. Freie University uh, of Berlin um, in meteorology, got his PhD uh, degree. And then you had a short stint in the European Space Agency as well. I think you worked there on a project. Uh, he is um, active in several NASA field campaigns. And that I think triggered his postdoctoral research was done then in Columbia University. And uh, right now he is an associate research scientist at NASA GIS, continued his work there. And it seems uh, very successful and staying there, I hope. And uh, yeah, and with that, uh, without further ado, Florian talks about aerosol cloud precipitation interaction in the Northwest Atlantic cold air outbreaks. There were a couple of field campaigns, DOE-funded field campaigns on that topic, and I'm curious what you will tell us. Please take it away. Thank you, Florian. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here, and it's, uh, yeah, it's better to present the work of the past uh, four years or so. It feels a little bit like a PhD defense. Uh, anyway, today we talk about cold air outbreaks and uh, mostly seen through the lens of the Activate campaign. Um, why cold air outbreaks? Um, we can start asking. And uh, there's one obvious reason, maybe that uh, clouds are bright. And they're bright, especially there where the other the, the ocean surface underneath would be dark. So you can see, for example, um, I here two fields of low-level clouds that are uh, particularly bright exactly over the ocean, and they form, uh, sort of show an albedo maximum, and then dissipate after that and sort of become, show a, a lower scene albedo again, a lower ability to reflect solar radiation. Um, in these low level clouds, the long of impact is kind of negligible since the cloud top is usually uh, close to the surface temperature. Um, these low level clouds that we talk about mostly today are still challenging for general circulation models or system models as you want to call them. Um, and some of these, um, um, uncertainties then mean uh, sort of uncertainty for climate projections uh, due to various feedbacks. Um, these systems can be driven by, by greater parent systems. In this case, it's an extra tropical cyclone that we're mostly focusing on. That's um, in this, in this uh, image you can see it here. And where this low pressure system sits, there's usually a warm front, that's the red one, and then the cold front is this um, blue one here. And we're in the wake of this. Um, of this cold front where subsiding motion usually just allows low level clouds. And if under regular circumstances, we just call it a post frontal cloud. And if it's cold enough, we call it a cold outbreak in these middle latitudes. And okay. we just move the header away. So it's out yep. of the sight. And so um, we can take, for example, work from a, George, from a colleague, George Siliudis, who uh, takes an image like this and chops it into cloud glasses. Okay gives each of these little um, squares a number according to its optical thickness and its um, height, and then can um, ask how well um, do models uh, represent this. And so um, down here, I'm showing you different classes and I'm showing you also the short wave effect of these classes. And there's uh, a bunch of CMIP6 models that were taken here. And you can see that uh, some groups, the observational targets, the lines are met well by the models, but for some, they're off. And that is uh, reason enough to look into these clouds. Um, 
And so the overall goal here is to better understand, to better capture code outbreaks in, uh, in a system model like GIS model E um, for more reliable uh, climate projections. Now, um, these clouds are believed to be strongly impacted by cloud aerosol interaction, and that's nothing new. We know already from images like this, uh, ship tracks, where uh, there was local seeding, and you can see everywhere, everywhere where there was exposure to, to sort of ship-made aerosol, the clouds are much brighter, um, and they have a different morphology perhaps also. Everywhere else, you can see a much dimmer field of uh, different morphology. And in, in simulations also, you can uh, run um, two different sets here, one with a um, low albedo, uh, sort of low aerosol lambda concentration, and one with a high one. And you can see immediately differences as they evolve from top to bottom um, in their in their brightness and also in their morphology. And they could go on, on and on. This is a very uh, rich field of literature, too rich to, to list here. Now, um, just let's briefly um, uh, talk about cloud aerosol interaction. Um, as I'm sure you all know, aerosol, um, in supersaturated conditions are acting as a nucleus to um, cloud droplets. Um, and the, these aerosols originate from a wide variety of sources. And at one typical, one famous effect, of course, is all else being equal, more aerosol means brighter clouds, the Tumi effect. And um, I want to just briefly talk about removal uh, processes, um, the removal of aerosols. So in warm clouds, it is um, the simple collision and coalescence process that forms rain. And this rain then can also fall and collect other droplets. So each of these is an individual collisional event, and each of these events removes an aerosol by number. That's the idea here. In mixed phase clouds, it's just uh, more types of hydrometeors. So now we have way bigger and more, um, uh, um, yeah, way different hydrometeors in size um, and concentration. And so these um, frozen hydrometeors can then aggregate, self aggregate, or they can also uh, fall and collect droplets. Um, and that's often associated with rhyming here. And so, as I already said, um, also here we have collisional events, and again, these collisional events lead to the removal of aerosol by number. Now, um, these very microphysical processes are expected to have an impact onto the cloud microphysics. So what is a good framework to understand the connection between the two? And so um, we've chosen the Lagrangian perspective. So if you take a satellite image like this and overlay it, um, sort of foreshadowing the activate uh, campaign here a little bit, a flight track from one day, we could take a giant box like this and simulate everything in it at the highest possible resolution, but that would be very expensive. It's much cheaper, for example, to have a box um, as uh, shown here that is only um, order 20 to 50 kilometers squared, or sometimes we go to the length of maybe 100 kilometers squared in size, fine resolved, and then move it with the boundary layer wind speed. Um, and so all the forcings will be changing as a function of time, which is then also a function of kind of distance. If you look at this graph here, for example, the underlying sea surface temperature changes as the simulation continues and so forth. Um, the advantage here is again much cheaper. We only need to care of the take care of the upward initialization. Um, there's downsides. Um, it is much more effort to prepare these simulations. For example, uh, we first need to go to reanalysis here and extract trajectories that we think are, um, are plausible and then um, that is, that is a big step to take and makes, makes it more time consuming. And it's also, just like with other large scale simulations, we need to take care of what happens if the free troposphere doesn't ex experience the same wind speed and direction as the boundary layer wind that we sort of here assume. And there we usually um, go towards the free troposphere nudging and nudge to um, conditions above the boundary layer that are changing perhaps as a function of time and space here. And this also, the Lagrangian perspective, can uh, allow to narrow the focus during field campaigns. So, this is an example where uh, the flight took uh, sort of most of the flight uh, probed, sort of um, tried to probe much of the cloud deck, but then one portion was dedicated just to the downward direction in this case. And so it, it can allow to, to um, narrow the focus here uh, by either doing this quasi Lagrangian track, since the aircraft is much faster in speed than the actually moving air, air mass. Or in this case, we had a second flight that day, we could try and revisit an air mass that was probed early on, and then it's expected to translate uh, slowly downwards. And again, there's downsides um, that makes, for example, the flight plane much more demanding if uh, one tries to revisit an air mass or try to find trajectories that are good to follow. And it's also uncertain success since we don't know what this air mass is gonna look like in five hours from now when we have a second flight that day. So um, 
just to talk briefly about the bigger goal here before I narrow down on a, on a little bit of this. So uh, the idea basically is to take a field campaign like Activate like often enough under uh, diverse conditions enough to um, here, I'll talk a bit a little, little bit later about this. We have two aircraft here that sort of flew um, in tandem uh, these, these patterns. And so to collect data from these via these two aircraft, then initialize and also evaluate LES. Um, that's shown in the second step here. This is like Russian LES that is just motivated. And then um, here we, for example, use reanalysis data from MERA2 um, or ERA5 also and run them on NASA supercomputers. And then lastly, um, once we gain understanding between these two, we can make a step to the single column or the, to the GCM world, to the system model world, and take a single column model, single column from, from such an Earth system model and expose it to the same initial conditions of the same forcing that the LES uh, domain experienced. So this can also be a Lagrangian simulation to single column model. And so today I'm mostly talking about field campaign and the LES part um, where we sort of learn a lot about um, uh, yeah, the field and um, try to, to simplify things for the, for the SEM world. Um, and then there's also, of course, uh, satellites that should, one should not forget that sort of uh, steadily orbit and could, in addition to field campaign, help us evaluate things. And I'll, I'll show the examples today. So how does the cold air outbreak typically evolve? This might be not news to, to some of you, but just for the sake of it, I'm uh, uh, so sort of spelling it out. So we have uh, from the continent, so we're here at the eastern seaboard of the United States, this is the Atlantic Ocean, uh, fat, sort of cold air moving at relatively fast speed. And that is usually an, a good ingredient for enormous surface fluxes. And so the numbers I'm showing here over time are latent and surface sensitive heat fluxes. And if you lump them together, they would exceed any possible solar input. So we're beyond 1400 watts per square meter here of uh, peak um, sort of turbulent energy input. So these um, enormous surface heat fluxes um, sort of produce, um, sort of ingest moisture and heat into um, a very pretty well capped boundary layer, um, which then leads to the formation of clouds. And on the right side, I'm giving you a few metrics. So we have inversion height on the on the top, and we have cloud cover, liquid water paths, the ice water paths. Um, in this liquid water, there's cloud and rain, and this rain is spelled out here. Um, Again, in the in panel E, and at the bottom one is the cloud drop at number concentration. And so the very first um, typical evolution is that the cloud top starts deepening as a function of these enormous uh, sort of surface fluxes. And the cloud deck that forms here sort of ramps up to, to fairly high values of 400 grams per square meter soon produces a uh, near overcast or overcast uh, field. We have no rain yet. And we have a mysterious uh, decrease here in droplet number concentration that I'm going to talk about in a moment, but uh, for now, just um, accept the fact that it's secret. And that's what LES, for example, produces if we just pick a 20 kilometer uh, square size domain. The next step, we will soon then have a cloud deck that's juicy enough and under decreasing enough uh, droplet number concentration that precipitation form. This could be either rain or it could be frozen hydrometeors that fall out there, but it's in these mid latitudes, it's mostly rain that dominates the picture. We'll talk about um, the frozen uh, material in a moment. And so that then, this rain, onset can be seen here, um, usually then even further decreases ND. And where we have still slightly, and, and sort of a maximum of liquid water pass. And where we have a, a high level of liquid water and a decreasing ND will just make more precipitation, which will even more remove uh, droplet numbers. And so we have a positive feedback loop. And so precipitation is kind of a, um, uh, just like in the studies I've showed, is a, is a driving force uh, for the rest of the evolution of this cloud deck. Precipitation means that everything that falls out has a chance to sublimate if it's frozen or melt and uh, evaporate, or if it's rain, just evaporate and cool and moisten the subcloud layer. And the subcloud layer, if it's cooled and moistened, means that we stabilize the vertical airflow. We will we'll prohibit um, vertical motion. And in this case, under um, steady high surface fluxes, that means we increase a, a very low layer here that is uh, sort of that sort of traps heat and moisture and just um, tries to then from here on out uh, bubble it up. So these sporadic convection event, convective events that then looks like this. And assume this open cellular form if the dynamics, the large scale dynamics allow. Um, but yeah, you can see a broken cloud state that's then. You can see this decrease in top fraction. You can see that we overpass the past the liquid water pass maximum 
but we're on a steady high rain. So most of the sleep water path is really just rain. And the cloud deck, uh, sorry, the boundary layer, sorry, um, by now has warmed enough that ice is no longer um, habitable in these. And as you can see, we reached sort of a low uh, ND, like a low drop in number concentration environment. So um, that's, yeah, that's, what is the impact of ice here? Um, but before we um, ask that, I just want to highlight, so these transitions are truly um, initiated by substantial rain, um, just like in studies that, for example, Yamaguchi showed in, in warmer clouds. Um, but what happens if we don't allow droplet numbers to decrease? What if we retain them? So that's an experiment I'm showing here. So these are the same panels. I hope I don't need to explain. Maybe added surface precipitation. But these are two experiments. The um, orange line is the one we've just seen on this slide before, where we had interactive aerosol that allows to be consumed and decreased. And then we have now um, a blue line that is uh, that doesn't allow loss um, of these aerosols. So we can see that the droplet number of concentrations are retained. And then it has applications. For example, the cloud cover doesn't fall below a certain value. It stays at 80% or above. And we can see that um, the liquid water paths uh, allowed to grow a little more. Um, and that um, is because the rain was delayed, but it's also generally smaller in, in magnitude. So the CC and losses is an integral part of this transition and then also in the response of the cloud production. Okay, back to the question of what um, role does ice in these clouds have? And I just want to briefly uh, mention ice is treated very uh, crudely here. So we impose a maximum um, INP concentration, um, typically one per liter. And that squashes all, that's for us the squash of all uncertainty connected to primary and secondary ice formations. We're virtue of having up to one per liter where there's enough uh, liquid and cold enough conditions. We uh, allow more ice to form there. This ice can then translate into other species like uh, snow or uh, rime particles uh, that are treated in the model. And we can also allow still secondary ice processes, but Caleb Mosso, for example, won't kick in until very late, until way beyond halfway the simulation where most of the breakup already happened. Okay, so the question of what role does ice have? So here we see an experiment, a pair of experiments, one with no ice in, um, in orange and the blue one that has up to one per liter of ice. And we can see um, the cloud tech breaks up sooner. Um, we also don't reach high enough um, liquid water as we just did. We now suddenly have ice where there was none before. And we can see that the surface precipitation um, shows a um, value above zero where there was a where there was a zero line before. We can also see a sooner dip in droplet number concentration. Um, we take a metric like this delta, which measures how much moisture is the bottom of the boundary layer compared to the top of the boundary layer. And this gives us an indication of stratification. And we can see and under no ice, we have a very low stratification up until the breakup, but with ice now, we suddenly stratify before um, the breakup even occurs. This also then means we have less vertical motion, and we also then, for example, have impacts like uh, less entrainment, that is um, the deepening of the cloud against the subsiding motion of the, of the free troposphere. Um, so and this all amplifies if we impose more ice, so four or 16 per year, all these just described effects just uh, become stronger. So let's understand what's exactly happening. So uh, here we look through the lens of an aerosol budget and we'll do it a couple of times this talk. So I'm trying to be as precise as possible. But please feel free to ask if, I'm, if I missed uh, the point. So the top panel shows no ice. We can see the overall evolution of all, uh, this is counting all activated plus unactivated aerosol inside the boundary layer. The change rate of this is shown in the black line. So you can see it's always negative. So you always decrease in aerosol. And it uh, starts out fairly small and then dips exactly here in this top panel where the rain onset is. And then sort of decreases slowly as we have a smaller reservoir of aerosols to be removed. And then we can take um, sort of the complete information from LES and try to um, attribute these changes now to, to different processes. The um, green line is, for example, the microphysical loss. So now we have these collisional events. We can see exactly where aerosols are being consumed. And the green line doesn't elevate or so, so it did until um, four or five hours or so in this case, before it's fairly small. Then there's a the yellow line or the orange line here, that is free tropospheric entrainment. I have not mentioned that, but we set up the boundary layer as we saw in, in the field, with a slightly lower concentration compared to the, to the boundary layer, which is fairly polluted. So any entrainment of air, so any deepening into the free troposphere and any subsiding motion, these both factors um, entrain air and free tropospheric air into the boundary layer that dilutes um, as seen here in this orange line. And that is the first um, uh, the first dominant term. 
Now, if we go over to a simulation that contains ice, we can see that the green line, the microphysical loss, um, becomes dominant much sooner. And the dashed line tells us that is due to rhyming. So here we have, even before rain is uh, initiated, we have um, the collection of droplets by frozen hydrometeors, and that uh, creates a loss that dominates much sooner than it would in a noise. Um, so we can see the role of rhyming here in a multitude of effects. We reduce liquid water paths, and we talked too much about that. We can see a more rapid decrease in ND, as we just seen through the lens of this aerosol budget. And we have this earlier precipitation of rhyming grown crystals that exactly do the stratification part of this cooling and moistening of the layer. And so in this paper, we collectively sort of um, labeled this preconditioning by rhyming, preconditioning the, the cloud transition. Um, we can go a step further and analyze now a much bigger bunch of simulations. So, for example, chop this orange simulation here to um, two periods, exactly where the cloud formed and where it dissipates, and then create a second uh, here this uh, rainwater pass a second a third time actually where the rain is uh, substantial enough to to call it substantial rain. Because this then forms two periods: one between cloud formation and rain onset, and one between rain onset and cloud break. We can uh, take these two periods and now try and measure in, in a wider number of simulations how this how these times and these these so periods behave. So this is the first period on the left panel. And you can see uh, the simulation I just showed. It's fairly constant. We're still somewhere between two and a half and three and a half hours uh, when it comes to the, the time between cloud formation and rain onset. It's a weekly a function of this uh, ice that we impose. The second time, however, how long it takes from the time the rain is onset, or the rain onset happened to the cloud breakup, that now is a strong function of the um, available number of, of frozen hydrometeors in the, in the clouds. And this, uh, these different lines show you different initial aerosol con concentrations. So as you would expect, the rain onset is delayed and we just imposed a higher number of, of, of aerosol at the boundary there. Now, we can ask, is this all realistic? Is this so essentially, this describes a negative cloud climate feedback and activate now that it's sort of concluded has shown that most code outbreaks indeed show rain particles. But that's just a weak um, support of this uh, of this idea here. Um, and much stronger would be to go to observations, for example, to look into satellite image. And here, I want to just briefly highlight a, um, a study from Dr. Shazar et al. from 2021. They uh, built composites, uh, so they took this uh, satellite retrievals over this activate domain here, or it's a bit bigger. And then uh, focus on this red box in here and build composites based on um, the retrieved droplet number concentration. So in the middle, you would see sort of median conditions. And to the right, and to, the, to the left, you see less than median. To the right, you can see a little bit higher than median conditions. And it turns out this right side is a good proxy for code outbreaks. Um, for example, um, you can see here that the flow pattern now becomes this uh, northwest to southeast flow that, we've, uh, that we could have guessed from the satellite image I showed initially. That's very typical. You can see that uh, subsiding motion, where it was kind of uh, more random before, suddenly it's more organized and seems there's more strongly subsiding motion here. And we can also see that cloud top height that usually increases away from the coast increases even further. We start out with a, with a shallower cloud deck that deepens much, much stronger um, than under medium conditions. And so and then also we can see that rain is uh, where it also slightly increased as a way of function as a function away from the coast. Now it's shifted downward, uh, which is a little contradictory because we've just seen that um, this aerosol maximum sits at this diagonal here, but that doesn't ex that couldn't possibly explain by the rain that's now shifted even even further away from this diagonal. So here we ask which processes are indeed um, drive this and just this drop that number this ND gradient. And which what's important to consider in cold outbreaks when simulating it. And we posit here, oh, we think it's free tropospheric entrainment that dilutes um, the boundary layer before uh, before the rain is even set on, as we've just seen it in the simulation. So let's see if it, if it really works. So here we take field campaign data from Activate. And this is a, um, the King Air that was equipped with remote sampling probes. Uh, there's an HRL2 on board. Uh, we have uh, drop zones that also fall from this. We have the RSP instrument developed at NASA GIS that sort of has polarized uh, imagery and can sort of retrieve um, more than a regular imager would be able to retrieve. And this aircraft flies at several kilometers altitude, way uh, above the cloud deck. And then we have the Falcon Air that's uh, loaded with in situ probes 
uh, several um, cloud probes that combined stitched together the whole size uh, range that you could imagine for the for the size distribution and same for the aerosol and there is trace gases being measured and so forth. And so a day like this could be looking at follows. So here you see the image I already showed on the right, this case from March uh, 1st of 2020. Uh, it was a pattern flown. And if you look at this, set of this top down, you know it is a function of time and height. You can see how this Falcon aircraft did is air stepping through the atmosphere. You can also tell where the aircraft turned around. So as I said, the cloud deck increases in height as we go away from the shore. That means this must be roughly the halfway point here where the aircraft reached the maximum altitude before it turned around and experienced shallower clouds again. Then we have a view of what the free troposphere looks like uh, through the lens of this um, attenuated backscatter. And we can also, uh, for example, look at the in situ measured uh, here aerosol size distribution that where there's a greater concentration, it's just uh, redder. So uh, as a function of time, we can see how size evolves. And so from a flight like this, we chop um, data into uh, smaller intervals, here 50 second intervals that creates uh, a nice number of legs, a little triple the number that you'd usually do in a, in a situation like this, where you're just uh, worried about clear horizontal legs. Um, and then we also classify each of these legs by their respective position to, uh, to clouds. Uh, so either it's cloudy because we measured cloud particles in here or it's above cloud because it's uh, we can see here in the HSRL measurements this uh, protruded the cloud deck and we must be in the free troposphere, or we are below cloud, or even near surface if the altitude is very low. And this then looks as follows. We took this, take this flight track and chop it up, classify it. Green is below cloud, red is above cloud. These are the most important samples. Everything else is either cloudy or sort of too, too close to call. And then um, I have mentioned the CCN probe that's also on board that measured, uh, as you might be familiar with, in two modes. Uh, we have a constant supersaturation, usually set to 0.43, or scanning. And if the second uh, was, was running, we interpolated to the, to the value that was usually measured under constant conditions. And then most importantly, we find, try to find a framework now where we cast this data into. So here uh, you can see this image. Uh, we've uh, drawn this uh, line that's a uh, sort of great circle line that roughly marks the cloud edge. And we approximated the, uh, the general wind direction here. And we use this line and this vector to cast all observations into um, a line that follows this vector and is zero where the cloud deck starts. So negative values would be upwind and positive values would be upwind. And that's exactly this x-axis here. So zero is the cloud edge and then negative is upwind until we hit the coast here. And then this is the far Atlantic up to the right. And here I'm showing on the vertical axis CCN concentrations, um, and then the red bars also the droplet number concentration being measured. And for the different classes, so we have clear above cloud, these are the points at the bottom, usually order 100 to 200 um, uh, particles per, per cubic centimeter. And then in the, free, in the boundary layer, we have uh, two classes, clear below cloud, and one again closer to the surface, but they both behave fairly similarly. So. Uh, they, they could be thrown to one pot here um, that are much greater in concentration by an order of magnitude, so between 1,000 and 2,000 per, per cubic centimeter. And then, as you can see, uh, start decreasing as soon as the cloud deck uh, starts forming. Um, and that is also then reflected in decreasing droplet number concentrations. Now, this is, seems to be typical. So whenever we take flights, and at that time, we had roughly eight good flights available, um, we can have the scatter plot of uh, boundary layer concentration versus free troposphere concentration we always find ourselves below this diagonal, which means um, the free troposphere could only act as a sink, not as a source. That's true for the CCN data. That's also true for a CN counter. For example, counting all particles greater than 10 nanometers, we always uh, to the right, mostly to the right of this diagonal. So we can go one step further and sort of now uh, prepare a budget given the available observations and the auxiliary data. And here uh, we, again, find ourselves in the Lagrangian uh, framework. So we have a quantity H, that's the boundary layer average quantity that evolves over time as a function of three sources, the internal source, the surface source, the lower boundary, and an entrainment at the upper boundary. And then this entrainment could be further spelled out by the gap between the free troposphere value and the boundary layer average divided over the boundary layer height here times the entrainment rate. And so um, it's very tough to obtain entrainment rates from observations, but we, here we approached it through uh, the trace gas uh, measurements, where we knew there are no internal surface, no, no internal sources and no surface sources. This 
average only average trace gas will only change as a function of entrainment. So there's also a gap in, in CO in, in carbon monoxide values here. And on the right, you can see what we retrieved. So as a function of fetch, again, zero is the cloud edge, and left and upwind collapse down. We can see that um, the values we obtain here peak at 12 uh, centimeters per second, uh, which again is uh, a fairly large value, order of magnitude greater than you would find in subtrop in, in um, yeah, subtropical Australian cumulus clouds, for example. And we try to corroborate this with another method. And you can see this other method that I'm going to just briefly mentioned has way larger error bars. It's using a uh, ghost based um, sort of evolution of cloud top height against a background of um, real analysis found um, sort of subsidence along these, uh, this lag here that's called Lagrangian. And that is uh, sort of our sort of corroborating method. Um, it's easy to fall into this range thanks to the large error bars, but I think. Um, yeah, we were pretty happy with it. And so then we have a surface source. Here we can use a parametrization and feed in error five new surface wind speed. And we can also try to uh, approximate the internal values by using cloud probed um, hydrometeor size distributions and just calculate what it what the removal, what the collisional rate would be given a certain size distribution. And here constraints using the retrieved liquid water pass and the cloud top pipe just to pr prepare profiles of this. And so what you can see on the right side is then as a function of fetch again, um, this yellow line, this entrainment, free atmospheric entrainment dominates the sort of during the duration of this flight, this picture. The overall change is this blue and white line here, and the microphysical loss is the green line, and it only just towards the endpoint. Maybe let's switch back to the symmetry. The aircraft, as you can see, just reached um, the, the sort of albedo maximum here didn't probe the, the open, the, the breakup state. Further downwind, I guess we would have uh, seen a more dominating picture of microphysical loss, but that's just where the aircraft kind of turned around. Now, um, I, I hope I didn't give you this picture that this is all aerosol dominated code outbreaks. So we've also wondered about meteorology. I uh, just want to give you an example. Um, here, we took the same case, actually this pre campaign case that we've already looked at wondered what ice does to these clouds and uh, sort of wondered why this cloud uh, deck looks as it does. And so you can see the approximate boundary layer flow here through these trajectories. You can see that to the north, the overcast state sort of uh, bound here by this isoline seems shorter than the, than the southern end of this postfrontal area. And that reminded us of um, a dry intrusion. So this sketch is almost uh, what, 30, 30 years old, um, but it shows uh, kind of a dry intrusion as, as it's sketched here. So we have a low pressure system that sits in the top right of this satellite image, high pressure system near Florida here. And in between, we have the post frontal area that's sort of, as a sketch suggests, inhomogeneously affected by the dry intrusion. So this air comes from high up in the pre troposphere, it subsides over to the overlying uh, the boundary layer, and then either lifts up to the north or fans down even further towards the south. So to understand that's uh, a possibility, uh, we looked at two data. And uh, dry intrusions are indeed frequent in this area that's been studied by, by for example, Ravi Rubin here. Um, so here we extract meteorological data, sort of combining this case. We can see the sea surface temperature where the Gulf Stream sort of peels off east and seaboard. Some trajectories hit that Gulf Stream a little later, some bit others. <laughs> And we can see here at surface pressure, this is indeed where the low pressure sits, but that's also where the highest wind speeds, the new surface wind speeds can be found. And further away, uh, there's a gradient that the wind speed becomes uh, smaller and smaller. There's also, we can see the post frontal area is dominated by the subsiding motion. Like it's pretty, pretty clearly see where that's happening. And interestingly, the subsiding motion is slightly stronger uh, further away from the um, low pressure system compared to the closer. And there's also a metric that's called the marine cold outbreak index that I have mentioned that, that measures the potential temperature of the sea surface compared to a slightly higher altitude, usually 850 hectopascal, and just is an indicator of how convective uh, of a boundary layer one can expect. And so I don't show all fields that we uh, sort of scrutinize here, but what we usually find is that closer to the low pressure system compared to further away, we find a slightly more humid free troposphere, weaker free tropospheric large scale subsidence, stronger boundary layer wind speed. The colder boundary layer, it's just because we're further north, and also stronger amp index that's usually then also associated with what's called the lower tropospheric stability, another reverse index of how um, stable or not stable um, the boundary layer is. And so, if you look at the literature, not just colder outbreaks, but all sort of boundary layer literature, 
it's uh, these different indices pointed to the same direction, either that it's it's likely to have a very juicy cloud deck or a uh, sort of have a more likely transition um, as a function of these parameters, or already see a broken state. Um, so uh, these uh, indeed these uh, sort of quantitative arguments point to the same direction. But we have LES, so we could take uh, just four of these trajectories, simulate them, and understand that we really uh, sort of uh, see what we think is going on. And then just to note, this is a pre-campaign case. So here we just used idealized aerosol, which is a single log normal mode of accumulation mode aerosol that has a certain concentration and usually uh, readily activates. So uh, well, you're mostly familiar with these panels now. Um, this is two cases now um, showing N3 that sits just further to the south, but it's closer also uh, sort of compares well with this, with this other southern trajectory. And I'm showing you the blue one, which is also comparing well with the with the trajectory further north, the pink one. And so these are the two representatives of the northern and southern end of this post bubble sector. And I'm showing you a cloud top temperature, cloud cover, optical thickness, liquid water pass, droplet number concentration, and surface precipitation. And I'm showing you these quantities because now we have reconnected observational constraints. We've taken satellite uh, retrievals for each of these um, parameters just to, to be sure. And so, um, yeah, we can now see, for example, certain things that the cloud cover indeed now a simulation. That's the solid line is the baseline setup. And then we have a few um, microphysical or um, a few plausible configurations that we that we're not constrained by by observations. So there's a bit of wiggle room, and I'm just going to demonstrate that it's wiggle room is uh, can be can be big here. But in general, we find that the southern end uh, has like a longer overcast period compared to the north. We can see that the northern trajectories indeed reach uh, colder cloud top temperatures temperatures that usually is a good proxy for how much ice is in there, but there's no uh, good retrieval for ice water paths, so we're not showing it here. And then we can see that in the north, we can see a way steeper increase of liquid water paths, and vice versa, a way steeper decrease of droplet number concentration compared to the southern end, which then unsurprisingly results in a slightly sooner and also more intense uh, rain done for surface precipitation. Um, and again, we can try and understand now what's going on through the lens of budgets. Um, so here I'm showing you just like the budgets I've shown you initially, the first study, but squashed over time and just measuring uh, sort of rates before the rain starts. So just between cloud formation and rain onset this period. And what you can see is going from the south to the north, that's N9 and 1 through N9 here. We can see, for example, that free tropospheric entrainment increases almost linearly as we go from south to north. So that dil this dilution effect um, it becomes stronger and stronger as the cloud deck is, about, is able to deepen further there. And we can also see that the, in gray that the collision loss um, is increasingly stronger, which has to do with the fact that there's more ice in these clouds, so we consume more droplet numbers through, through for example, rhyming. Um, and so one good ingredient for, for precipitation is a reduction in aerosol or aerosol concentration. And one other good ingredient is increasing liquid water paths. And here we um, use cloud geometric thickness as a proxy. And uh, for, for example, knowing that the cloud space is relatively steady, I'm not showing it here, we just uh, worry about the cloud top. And that indeed, as the solid blue bars here show, is um, increasing stronger going from south to north here. And under the white bars, you can see that is the subsidence rate that's prevalent at these areas. It's uh, usually increasing stronger where the subsidence is weaker. And so we tested this, I'm not showing it here, but for example, we took trajectory N9 and gave it the, the substance, the stronger substance from N1, and indeed found the expected effect that the cloud deck takes longer to, to break up um, if, if substance is increased. And so um, in a nutshell, this is all more, more detailed shown in the paper that, that I've listed here. Um, uh, we can update a sketch, for example, here from George Siludis and Kevin Greece that uh, showed air flows that were expected to, to drive cloud patterns. And add the dry intrusion. It's been known before the dry intrusions are there, but it's not been clear that they affect kind of the cloud, the cloud pattern. And so uh, the dry intrusion has sort of two roles here at the southern end. We have weaker, uh, we have stronger subsidence, sorry. So under stronger subsidence, we keep the boundary layer shallow, prevent it from entraining air, or prevent it from coming in too cool. So that takes longer for, for rain to set on, versus the second uh, number two here, where we have weaker subsidence, and the opposite is happening, the cloud tank. Indeed, uh, this uh, sort of lives shorter if you want, or the cloud covers uh, decreases heat earlier. And so, very lastly, I just want to um, show you 
that now that activate data is final, uh, an effort of how to set up a case like this, but using observations. The first thing you do is you take a bunch of observations and you realize, hold on, this is, this is very messy. And, and you start seeing patterns and sometimes these patterns make sense. I just want to give you uh, one, one of these sort of anecdotes um, in the last few slides. So one thing we discovered very, very, um, very recently is uh, if you take a multi-flight composite of say, and he resolve it by time, and this is the lowest size sort of portion of the aerosol measurements starting at three nanometers and here I'm you capping know, it at hundred or so. Um, you can see that there is uh, what seems like a recent particle formation event. And that is uh, consistently seen in most cold air outbreaks uh, that, we, that we probed. So the particles seem to be roughly spawning at say 15 UTC. And by the time I'm showing it here, they're already at five nanometers. And they sometimes then increase not only in size, but also in concentration over the course of the day. So by 22 UTC, that's sort of uh, five in the afternoon, you would expect them to maybe just uh, reach a size that's relevant to be activated as a, as a cloud particle. Uh, what we also see more often than not is an increase in accumulation mode concentration, and that becomes uh, more clear in a moment. Um, but we haven't fully understood that why. But the question is here, do these uh, changing aerosol uh, particle size distributions, they, have, they show multiple log normal modes usually, are these changes uh, coming with implications for the cloud properties and the cloud transitions? Um, and so here we focus on one case. That's one of the last uh, winter flights that, were, that happened in Activate uh, from uh, about two years ago, where uh, we can see at three times of the day, this was, there were two flights that day, and this is the earliest possible, or one of the earliest possible legs that we've seen sort of new particle, or recent particle formation, that's the blue line, and then evolves into larger and larger sizes uh, all the way through almost 21 UTC, so that's four in the afternoon. And then reaches about 30 uh, nanometers. That's probably just the size that becomes relevant. If you look at uh, here, a sketch as a function of supersaturation and the activated concentration that you would expect here for two different uh, hydrocopacities that we give the nucleation, nucleation mode, we can see that there's nothing really happening in the, mor in the morning. The blue line hides here under the, the bottom part of this orange line. And only once we reach perhaps 18 UTC, they can be, as the stash line indicates, the maximum LES reported supersaturation and effect that we that makes a difference in, in the simulated world. But once we reach uh, the late afternoon, um, we can see that the nucleation mode, if it had uh, lower or higher um, hyperscopicities, would crucially make a difference in the activated portion. So um, the first task um, is to determine a plausible couple. There, as I showed, there were CCN measurements, but they didn't always have ranging supersaturations. They would have indeed covered a range that's, uh, that would help you, but in this case, we just had a fixed uh, concentration down here, so just at the point where, um, where it did make a difference. Um, and then also assess uh, the potential impact of these part changing size distributions. Uh, by the way, uh, 0.05 and 0.7 are uh, motivated by a study uh, from, from Phillips and colleagues uh, that were happening at the, at the Eastern Seaboard that for three different modes here uh, produce size distributions. And as it happened, um, these two bind these, uh, the, the retrievals here nicely. Sort of, ex sort of extreme, uh, very kind of night boundaries. So the two flights that, that, that I'm sort of considering here for the day is this is the first flight. Uh, you can see the satellite imagery was taken at 14 UTC. Um, again, uh, one large portion was attributed to sort of quasi-Lagrangian flights that sort of uh, go along the wind, but at a faster speed. You can see again where the aircraft turned around that it happened as we flew out here. Uh, so one third into the flight, uh, we reached this point, but then took two thirds of the flight to return against the strong winds, uh, as you can tell from, from the rest of the graph here. And you can also see that the end, the late end of this flight just shows increased concentration as it returned in this uh, yellow area. The second flight then, uh, following a similar pattern, but you can see again in these uh, in situ probed aerosol size distributions, now the, um, the high numbers sort of increased in size. And so um, this is indeed the case that shows the strongest growth uh, among the, the cold outbreaks that we've seen, probably due to the fact that we sampled that late in that day, uh, which we didn't do at that point. And so we can now take a morning particle size distribution. I'm just showing you the mean diameters, the model diameters, 16, 30, and 210 nanometers and give them a boundary layer concentration of these numbers here, 2,500 and 250 per milligram. 
and just uh, impose two different sets of kappa values, one having the high values 0.7 and one the low values 0.05. And as you can see on the left side, these are now a couple more panels. So we have the, the scene albedo, the cloud cover, liquid water, rainwater pass, ice water pass, the maximum supersaturation in the model, droplet number concentration that we've seen before. Here I'm also showing now frozen hydromedia concentrations that uh, as a post hover around one per liter until the, the head of muscle process kicks in. Um, then we see surface precipitation and um, just for reference, electric like expense. And you can see between the two simulations, having a lower high kappa makes a huge difference to the evolving cloud deck. For example, the cloud deck breaks apart sooner if we make uh, aerosols less microscopic. But it also has implications for the scene albedo that is way reduced, not just because cloud fraction reduced, but also clouds themselves experience a tumi, the reverse tumi effect. Um, we can now sort of pepper in the observations. So here we have activated CEDO data to, to understand which kappa is plausible. Um, and these observations indeed scatter large enough that they don't really help us at this point. Uh, we have activate remote sending observations, mostly coming from the RSP probe. That's like an imager retrieves state water paths that has issues under certain conditions. Um, so that's, it's even outside this range here. And we can now also use uh, satellite uh, retrievals again. I just want to highlight two. One is the geostationary imager uh, that produces, for example, cloud cover, and it almost perfectly traces this low cover value here, this low cover line. And again, we have um, a retrieval that comes not from an imager, but this time from a microwave red, uh, radiometer or from a fleet of those uh, that's uh, part of the Mac liquid water pass product that's developed also at last year. And that both these uh, satellite products uh, help us to um, actually decide that the low copper value seem to be producing more plausible um, evolutions in, in the Lagrange in the LES here. And we can also understand uh, through this, these simulations what the role of multiple aerosol modes is. So here you can see the full uh, three modes in this orange line. If we remove the smallest mode, 60 nanometers, the um, simulations look near identical. And if we remove the second largest mode, the 30 nanometers, now the um, aerosols, uh, the, we just, we're not able to, uh, of course, activate more than the largest mode, 250 grams per, uh, per milligram here, sorry. Uh, so you can see the excess activated in the second mode that seems to be mattering, uh, especially yeah, for, for most of the simulation. Without the second mode, the cloud deck would break apart sooner. So it seems important to consider these multiple modes. Um, and then, of course, we can uh, go back to the initial question, what does it mean if the particle size distribution changes? And so here, um, I'm just taking the same size distribution that I've just used, the morning one, and now give it the strongest growth that's seen during that uh, second flight all the way to about 30 nanometers or so. And so um, the difference is huge, but I should also mention um, there's also a huge difference in the accumulation mode. So before we had 250 uh, per, milli per milligrams per square, per, about per, per cubic centimeter, and now we have roughly uh, quadruple that value. So the difference is huge if we uh, impose one or the other. Um, again, the afternoon would have a longer lived cloud deck, um, a slightly higher liquid water pass and so forth just because we are able to activate more uh, droplets and can use that to, to delay the rain onset. Let's see. But the question is, is that because of the accumulation mode or has it to do with the uh, uh, grown modes mode over, over this recent particle formation? And uh, here we use an intermediate particle size distribution where we donate from two smaller modes into this one, but then take the largest mode in the afternoon and uh, update that mode. And indeed, the uh, intermediate particle size distribution almost perfectly traces the afternoon. So the answer is just because the accumulation mode increased, we find suddenly find ourselves in a updraft limited regime, and that doesn't mean that means we're no longer dependent as much on the second mode as we as we were just hoping to. Be. So it's kind of a negative result of the study that um, despite the fact there was strong particle growth, uh, it was overshadowed by uh, the increased accumulation mode. So um, yeah, we're at the end of the seminar. I hope I give you uh, a good overview of our lessons learned. Um, again, frozen hydromedia is accelerated to introduce it. There's a training of free atmospheric air that dilutes air, uh, the boundary layer. We have dry intrusions that drive uh, cloud patterns, and we have the importance of multimodal aerosol uh, to capture evolving clouds. So that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Florian, for this nice and very clear talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. One. 
Yeah, yeah meanwhile, please. Yeah, so you showed the microphysical aspect of the campaign, the stimulation. Did you look at the macrophysics part, the cloud amount, the beds with the, the model captured? Uh, you mean the um, from measure during activate? Yeah, same, same the cloud amount. Yeah, for example, I haven't shown that, but uh, yeah, we, for example, use this, uh, for example, we use cloud top height instead of albedo to uh, where we have sort of HSRL cloud top retrievals. Cloud top height is a good, a good uh, variable to use. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the RSP instrument has sort of fairly large footprint, so it's hard to really retrieve a cloud cover from it. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess you could use in a in a long track product to for two two dimensionality, but it's yeah, it's not straightforward. Mm -hmm. Um so the macrophysical properties are limited in a in a sense from activate, but it's yeah a lot of value for the microphysics. Thank you. Any other question? Well, then I can I pose a question. And your second point you showed was really intriguing. You said the free troposphere dilutes the boundary layer CCN concentration. Mm -hmm. Is that a special case because we're on the East Coast and you have so much aerosol coming from the continent in? Often we argue, well, maybe the free troposphere is a source of additional aerosol or because what comes from the boundary layer gets advected and then activated and so if we need more, maybe it comes from the cloud top in and trained. But here, I saw your number, though you have still thousands of aerosols per cubic centimeter, mm -hmm. 200 kilometers off the East Coast. That can only be because the East Coast, well, it's pollution aerosol. Therefore, the hygroscopicity is likely low too because it's organic. It's not right. sea salt necessarily. Right. And so is that, would you expect this point too, also in a remote area or you know over in the Arctic or Antarctic? Any I'm, guess on that? I wasn't sure until we worked on Combo, right, on the Norwegian Sea, where there's no such thing as a lot of anthropogenic pollution that uh, yeah. uh, gives you this sort of almost dirty boundary layer. If you go to the Norwegian Sea, high up the, the ice edges, that's yeah, almost the reverse. So you get oh. you, you you find still a uh, relatively high concentration of the boundary layer, but it's not that different from the free troposphere. Um, and these effects then shrink, right? So or one could claim this source. is a really an anthropogenic effect then. This whole hundreds of kilometers big cloud deck, it evolves like that because we trigger it with our huge East Coast pollution loop. I say that a little bit provocatively now. <laughs> Well, uh, in the absence of knowing any natural sources during winter time, exactly, I would expect that, yeah. In the winter time, we heat, we have biomass burning aerosol. It's less hygroscopic. It fits with kappa 0 0.05, 0 0.1. That's really interesting. I never thought about that. All right. Okay. Oh, there. So, uh, yeah, I have kind of a general question and then a specific. I'll start with the general. Okay. Um, the, uh, I've made the statement for decades uh, that, that Mother Nature knows how to make rain, warm rain in 15 minutes. Okay. But the modelers don't know how to make warm rain in 15 minutes. But are, are you going to state that you do know? <laughs> um, well, I have not put the yardstick to it, but things happen fast in cold outbreaks. I wouldn't. I would be a surprise as the order of magnitude matches. I don't show it can be 50 minutes. Well, and, and then the question, and why can't modelers make warm rain is because how do you get a droplet large enough to have an appreciable settling, gravitational settling velocity to scavenge and then grow on the way down because diffusional growth is so slow mm -hmm. when you get the particle is sort of in that transition regime before it can have appreciable gravitational settling, but essentially it's zero growth by diffusion. That's that's the pro that's the statement of the problem. And so you know, so I, I challenge you in some way to say, oh yes, we know how to make warm rain in, in 15 minutes, or or we don't. Well, I mean it's LES and we, even though we resolve many things, we don't resolve microphysics, right? And we're only as good as 
that would be given or would be looked at by the literature. And so we're dependent on the community to do perform good cloud chamber experiments or to uh, come up with better ways of parameterizing microphysical interactions. But yeah, you're raising a good point. There's uncertainty in what, what we use in the model. And yeah. yeah, and in all the points of the Hallett Mother process, then, which is also a lot of wiggle room, how much multiplication you have there, too. I think Ming Wa had, you had a comment or a question? No, no. I'm just a very steep question. Ah, okay, yeah, <laughs> right, good, good. All right. And my, my specific, if I can ask, like, if you go back three or four uh, slides, you had some satellite photographs. Yep. Um, yeah, that's a good one on the right. Um, what are all those streaks? These ones? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. You've got you've got a whole series of streaks that are going from from the uh, northwest to the southeast, and it, uh, uh, just you know much more discernible albedo mm -hmm. in all of these streaks that are more or less parallel to each other. And what's the reason? <laughs> yeah, you, you also remind me, I put, sort of didn't point out one of the most obvious things of cold outbreaks, we have cloud streaks, uh, which I didn't exactly spell out when I said it's where postfrontal clouds and some of these are cold outbreaks. Cold outbreaks are usually the ones with the streaks. And it's it's an interesting question. We just had this discussion in a model to comparison where we run a case, again, Norwegian Sea, and the satellite image suggests there should be cloud streaks, but the model can't sometimes produce them. And then in, over the eastern seaboard, the model has been shown this Dharma LES that we use has seen has shown uh, cloud streets in it, but under different conditions, even though we would expect them, they sometimes don't show. And so we did a literature survey and took all the recipes that are out there of how to make cloud rolls, cloud streets, and still couldn't couldn't wrap our heads around it. And so yeah, it remains to me at least mysterious enough, interesting enough well, to. That's, I'm sort of wondering: are, the, are we seeing the the sh the ship track, the city track, or something like that of of specific sources along the seaboard? That could be that could be an idea. Yeah. But, uh, Fascinating. but it comes also, this, as you said, in Comble in Greenland, or so you see it too. Mm -hmm. And there's not really, no, there are no, no chimney stacks. Of, uh, industrial activity. Yeah. And more pollution doesn't necessarily mean the cloud forms sooner or forms differently or shows dynamic patterns, right? It's uh, excellent observation. Yeah, I'm, yeah. looking at, I'm looking at this in North Carolina up to, to Rhode Island and Massachusetts, yeah. and that's, that's our industrial eastern seaboard. And all these very prominent streaks. Yeah. Yeah, clouds, you look up, you see them, and you never understand them. But you look down on the, on this kind of a scale, yeah. and I'm, I've said to myself, wow. Yeah, good point. It's like a ship track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a, a, a city track or something. Or, or People on the beach, they power pop a pen and so that. I, I, I don't, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I'd love to know the reasons for these tracks. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a mystery. We don't we cannot resolve that. For now, for now, we'll remain a mystery. Yeah. All right, great. On that note, uh going away from mysteries but to lunch. Everyone is invited. Let's thank Florian again for this really nice talk. <laughs>